Hello and welcome to the Northeast Law Review. My name is Nathan Cooper. As always, I'm joined by Rebecca Bestley. And today we are fortunate enough to be joined by Catherine Hollingsworth, who is a professor in law at Newcastle University and who specialises in children's rights and access to justice for children. Hello to you, Catherine. Thank you very much Hello. for being able to speak with us on this lovely February afternoon. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me. It's nice to chat to you both. Not a problem. Um, so before we get into your pretty extensive list of publications in this area. We wanted to ask you about your individual route into legal academia um, and how you specifically ended up being interested in children's rights and access to justice for children. Yeah, um, well, so I did my law degree at Sheffield, um, but I actually, uh, even that was a bit um, circuitous because I started off as a sociology student actually and did um, a year of sociology, which had always been the thing that I was most interested in, I think. Um, um, and then I switched to do law in my second year, um, primarily because I had a friend who was switching to do law. And so I thought that would be a good idea. It was, that, was, that was it. I knew nothing about being law. I don't come from a background of having anybody. Well, my parents didn't go to university. I went to a comp, didn't know any lawyers. Yeah, I, it, it would never would have crossed my mind to study law. Um, so even getting into doing law in a way, because I came in and at Sheffield, I actually only did a two year undergraduate degree. Um, because you could switch from having done like first year, I did first year sociology, you could switch into doing a two year law degree instead of a three year. But that meant that, as you guys will probably know, um, if you are planning on sort of a legal career, you're already on a back foot because you've not done your first year summer placement and you've kind of, you know, not thinking on that kind of, um, yeah, think about how to go into a legal career. And I, I knew no lawyers and it just seemed totally, um, inaccessible to me I suppose but what I did know is um, university life and I knew I love learning and so when I got to my third year instead of thinking about the legal profession as a, a potential route I saw a job advertised for a research assistant uh, um, at Sheffield and it was advertised in the Guardian and um, I saw it in my Easter holiday and just decided to give it a go thinking I stood no chance because I didn't have a postgraduate um, or anything like that um but I, I i got the job um i got a, i got a first at, at sheffield and um um yeah i got i got the highest degree <laughs> at sheffield so i think they thought perhaps i have potential so i basically worked as a research assistant for a year during that time i was doing some publications and then my boss was just encouraging me to apply for lectureship so i applied for a lectureship in a year out of basically a year out of law school uh, out of doing my degree for the year as a research assistant, had some teaching experience then. And then I got my first lectureship. So that, that would be really unusual now. There's um, nearly everybody has a PhD coming into the profession. Um, so I worked for six years at Cardiff University as a lecturer. And then I got to, I was 29 and I just thought, oh, I don't wanna do this anymore. I was researching in the area of um, um, more constitutional law then, um, public sector audit and how we hold government to account for its finances. And I'd sort of fallen into that. It wasn't really what I loved. So I jacked it all in and I went traveling to New Zealand. And um, while I was in New Zealand, I got a job at Otago Uni. And while I was there, I started rethinking about my research area. And um, I'd always loved um, sort of criminal justice at university. I was interested in children's rights. Just, just it was, I was just drawn to it. So then I applied to do a PhD at Cambridge and I came back and did my PhD sort of mid-career. Um, so I've done six years as a lecturer, a couple of years in Otago, working as a lecturer, then came and did my PhD and that did my PhD at Cambridge on, on children's rights and youth justice. Um, and it was purely because I felt I was interested in some of the key cases and, and ideas and the, the challenges that children present in the criminal justice system. So did my degree at PhD at Cambridge at that point and then got a job at King's College London and then moved up here. So I kind of... Um, I didn't fall into academia, I knew I loved learning and that was it for me, but um, I didn't do the standard route of postgraduate and then into a job. I got a job straight away <laughs> based on that, that I was publishing from sort of straight away, I guess. So that's how I fell in, not fell into it, but yeah. Um, would you be able to tell us about the Children's Right Judgment Project and how you're involved in it, basically? Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's a project that I co-directed with Professor Hol Helen Stolford, who's at Liverpool University, and she's a close colleague of mine. 
Um, and it was a project that was inspired. So you may have heard of the feminist judgments projects. So there's, um, or you may have read them, some of the some of that work in in, in some of your third year modules in particular. And, and it's the feminist judgments projects took existing legal judgments and academics put themselves in the shoes of the judge in a particular case and rewrote it from a feminist perspective. And so what Helen and I want to do was to kind of think about that from a children's rights perspective. So we, um, we basically um, did this big collaborative project. We had about 60 different um, contributors, so primarily academics, but some legal practitioners. And they, um, people sort of put um, proposals into us for a, a kind of key legal judgment that they were interested in, that they felt children had been, you know, the children's rights were not um, at the focus or at the heart of the decision, perhaps. Um, and then they rewrote it from a children's rights perspective. So bringing in the principles of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, bringing the child into the center of the narrative of the judgment, um, but all the time, uh, being bound by the evidence that was before the court at the time, the law that was in place at the time. Um, and so it was a two-year project and we had 30 cases. So each chapter was a case and had a commentary. So another person contributed the commentary. And it was just a really wonderful project. We had um, workshops that we invited judges and um, lawyers to, to make sure our judgments were authentic. So we had Lady Hale come, who I know you're going to be, am I allowed to say that? <laughs> Who are going to be in um, uh, We had court of appeal judges, and, and so we, we built this big network of, um, of supporters, really. And, uh, and, and we published a book a couple of years ago, Lady Hale did the forward, and we had the launch at the Supreme Court, which was one of the best days of my career. It was just such a brilliant, like sitting in the, you know, sitting, I was sitting in Lord Kersey um, next to Lady Hale, and she talked about the book and introduced it. and. Um, yeah, so it was a really, and then we've gone on to do other work from that. We've gone on to do judicial training from that. Um, so it's been a really, it's kind of the best thing about academic life, I think, is where you get a collaboration with a colleague who you love working with, who, who's a friend, who's, you know, you, your ideas spark from each other, um, and this big network of, of other scholars who we, you know, had the absolute joy of, of working with. So, yeah, so that was the Children's Rights Judgments Project. <laughs> Um, how significant are the so-called child-friendly um, judgments? Uh, how significant are they in attaining justice for those children? Yeah, so one of the things, so with the Children's Rights Judgments Projects, one of the things that Helen and I did in one of the introductory chapters was to identify sort of what we said were five characteristics of a children's rights judgment. So if you're looking at, you know, if you want a judge to adopt the perspective of a children's rights approach, what would you expect to see in the judgment? And one of those characteristics was that the judge would actually write the judgment for the child themselves. So, you know, we tend to think of legal judgments, you will know from reading cases that um, some judgments are really enjoyable to read, that you can follow them quite easily, they're maybe interesting, they've got more of a narrative, more of a story to them. Some judgments are really quite dry and it's um, you know, less about the people involved. And um, you know, Lord Kerr was brilliant, I think. Um, I was just reading one of his judgments recently, um, just the other day about criminal records and about whether how long a criminal record should last, you know, that might stand in the way of getting a job and, and so on. Um, and the three applicants in that case, so the three people who's you know, one was a, a lad, well, a man now who's in his 50s, but when he was 13, had, um, you know, some minor conviction, and he was still having to put it on his, um, on his, when he applied for a job that he had a criminal record, even like 40 years later, he'd never offended again. And, and what Lord Kerr does in his judgment is he actually, he contextualizes it. So he doesn't just talk about legal principles and broad, you know, broad concepts or generalizations he says you know for this man you know nathan cooper like he got the, this is what happened to him when he was a child these are the implications it's had for him throughout his life and he, he really make brings it he he's not you know it's, it's about how they how the judge constructs that narrative within the judgment so with a child friendly judgment or child sensitive judgment we're saying what we want to see is we want to see judges writing when when the child is at the heart of the proceedings so this is a, a case where a child is perhaps being taken into care um, or 
um, a case where a child's been, you know, one that you know one parent has abducted the child and taken them to another country, and the judge is having to decide wh whether where that's going to be determined that that child custody issue. Um, we're saying that we want to see judges actually writing it for the child, so the child can understand that judgment, can follow that judgment, and that we think that's important not only so that the for access to justice, like you know, the, the child being able to understand the decision that's been made about them but we also think really importantly that if a judge starts to write their judgments for the child themselves putting themselves in the shoes of the child really um, it means they have to have first of all listened to the child's experiences because we want that judgment to be speaking to the child and reflecting back to them their lives their experiences and their views so it helps to promote access to justice because it means that the the judge is having to ensure the child's participation through the proceedings as well and listening to the child listening and understanding what's going on for that child understanding their views and their wishes but we also think it might change how the judge um, uh, reasons the decision and the out the potential outcome of the decision because if the judge is writing it for the child they're really having to empathize with that child they're really having to understand things from that child's perspective they're really having to show that they've taken the child's welfare into account and what that actually means. And by doing all that, you might be actually changing how you think about the outcome and what's best for that child. And so we think it has, we, we call it this legal transformation approach, um, that if a judge writes a judgment for a child, it not only um, helps the child understand the judgment, which is part of our Article 6 rights, our you know, right to a fair hearing. It not only helps to encourage the child's participation, which is also part of Article 6, but it also potentially can um, substantively result in a better child rights judgment as well. So we think there's like different layers of, of why it's so important for justice and access to justice as well. So we see them, um, yeah, so um, <coughs> there are examples Peter Jackson, who's a court of appeal judge, has done some really good judgments for the child where he, you know, he writes them in a form of a letter. So, dear Sam, you know, you, you came to court this week and, and I heard from you and I spoke to your father about this and that. And that, you know, actually that's the level that they're, they're, they're delivering these judgments actually for the child at the, in the proceedings. So it's really very different way, very different than some of the legal judgments we'll be used to, um, but really interesting, I think. What do you identify as the four key requirements in creating accessible judgments for children? Yeah, so the so so one of them is, as I was just saying, this sort of um, the communicate what we call the communicative function. So I didn't put it in this way in my answer, but um, that's the you know that the judge should be aiming to communicate to the child in a way the child can understand, and we think that that's super important so that the um, uh, the child can comprehend and understand what's happening. That that might be um, both in terms of understanding the implications of the decision for them. So knowing that they have got to go and live with dad rather than mum, for example, if it's a, um, a child arrangements decision and why that, why the judge has come to that decision. Um, the child might have, that's really important because the child might have actually some really important insights that would inform an appeal maybe. We also think it's really important because it helps to enhance what we call procedural justice. Um, so the idea that if a person sees, um, perceives the decision as fair and as neutral um, and they trust the person who's delivering it, then they see that the decision as more legitimate and they're much more likely to comply with it. And we also think that that communicative function, that clarity in the communication is important because it can serve um, what's called therapeutic justice reasons. So it can help the child become um, reconciled with what was probably a very stressful time in their lives. What, you know, whatever that context, if a child is at the heart of some legal proceedings, something's probably gone wrong in their life or something's unsettled. So they might be trying to get a secure immigration status. They might be a family breakdown. They might be taken into care. They might be in criminal proceedings. That's probably gonna be a bin um, a difficult time for the child, possibly even a very traumatic time. And if a judgment is written in a way that, you know, um, that alienates the child, if, you know, some of the judgments we've read have been really interesting, you know, so like um, cases where a, a, a parent has abducted the child to another country 
you know, so there's been a uh, family breakdown. Dad has taken the child to the country dad's originally from, say Italy, um, and mum's trying to get child returned. In some cases, children, um, ordinarily what's supposed to happen is the child comes back to where they're originally from and the dispute is decided in the courts there. But in some, uh, there are exceptions to that. And one of those exceptions is if the child themselves objects to being returned home. And so we, Helen and I, uh, Helen Sulfur and I did some analysis of about 30 cases like that, reading the judgments to see how child rights compliant they were or not. And so, some of the, I wish I had the quotes now because one of the, there's a judge in a couple of cases and the way she talks about the child, you know, the child had obviously told the social worker to go and F off. Um, and the judge is like, you know, this was a you know, sort of like, this type of language from such a well brought up girl is just not acceptable. And, you know, um, she's basically, you know, this girl is too big for her boots and is, is, you know, the way she spoke about her, you just thought if that child read that judgment, that how would that impact on how the child felt not only about that judgment, like they're not going to trust it, they're not going to see it as fair, they're not going to want to comply with it. But also more generally, how is that child going to feel about the legal system and about judges in future? Like they're going to be totally alienated from a legal system and not see the law as being for them. And so part of that communication function is really important for the child to um, the procedural justice side, but also to show, you know, we've heard you, we, we see how hard this has been and we want your life to be better. We want to help you with that. And by speaking to the child like that through the judgment, we think that judges can have quite a powerful um, impact in this sort of like more therapeutic justice way as well. So that's the communicative function, procedural justice, therapeutic justice. We also talk about how judgments that are written for children can have a developmental function. Um, so helping the child to, you know, it might be about developing their autonomy, their, their capacities, their, their, how they feel about themselves, their self-worth, their self-respect. We talk about it having an instructive value and, and that we think, you know, if you imagine a case like Gillick, I don't know if you've done, have you done family law or medical law this year? Um, I do family law, yeah. yeah. So the Gillick decision, I don't know whether you've come across it yet, but really important decision in children's rights. It was about, um, you know, that if, if a child is under the age of 16, they're able to consent to um, medical treatment without their parents' consent as well, if they have requisite um, maturity and understanding. We want to see decisions like that written in a way that your average teenager can understand because this is a really important articulation of their rights and what they can demand um, and we think that the law should be accessible to children and should be have this instructive or educational value for them as well more generally not just the child at the heart of the proceedings and then the fourth function that we talk about is that legal transformation function that the way the judge writes the judgment if they put the heart the child at the heart of the proceedings if they write for the child it will lead to a better decision, a more compatible, a children's rights compatible outcome as well, not just how the decision reads, but actually what the decision does. Uh, so what is the relevance of the children's rights judgment project um, for children in the criminal courts? Um, yeah, I'm really, I mean, that's, thank you for asking that because um, a lot of the children's rights judgments, um, when we were looking at judge, judges writing for children, the examples that we have seen in real life, if you like, have been in the family law context. Um, in the criminal context, my, my own research as, um, you know, it's obviously children's rights, but I look specifically at children in the criminal courts. And I think initially we were thinking that, uh, well, I was thinking that because in, in criminal courts, what the judge is doing is delivering a sentence. So, you know, a person's pleaded guilty or been found guilty, and then the judge is deciding what sentence to give them and they're read out orally they're not like a written judgment you know so many other and that's you know they're off, um, in the in the family courts they're often read out orally as well um but in criminal courts they're not really very often published sentencing they're called sentencing remarks and that's the judgment if you like um there's a few online but generally they're not written down so i was thinking it didn't really have relevance but it's been really interesting i had i had lots of meetings with um, magistrates initially and then some crown court judges um, so you know the, the magistrate court is for the kind of um, lower level offending for children it's um, children are in the youth 
magistrates court if for offences up to about two years in prison and then in crown court with juries and, and wigs and so on for a more serious offending um, and they were all really interested in it actually and interested in the idea of how they could deliver their sentencing remarks in ways that were more um, child sensitive if you like so when generally when a judge delivers a sentence in remarks you know if you picture a courtroom you've got the defendant usually in the dock you know perhaps behind a glass often a glass dock um, for security and the judge is delivering the sentence and remarks to the whole courtroom you know so you've got the victim or the victim's family listening you've got the defendant you might have the media um, we, and with cases for children that they'd be reporting restrictions in place in most most cases but the media would still be there or the public gallery and so the judge has to really think okay who is the audience for my sentencing remarks who am I speaking to am I you know um and and it's a real challenge for them I think that's in law actually in in kind of criminal proceeding law um they have to deliver that they're told that they're writing for the defendant okay you're delivering it you know Becca you've been you, you pleaded guilty to, um, you know, section 18 um, assault against a person. Um, and I'm going to, you know, going to be sentencing you, blah, blah. Here's my reasons. And they do do that, but it's, they, it's really interesting because they are so conscious of the other audiences as well, of course. So, um, and, and there's a very formalized language. It can be quite impenetrable. If you do, you know, if, you, if anybody goes onto the, uh, Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunals website and you read some sentencing remarks you know a lot of them as well when they're working out how, how when they're saying why the sentence is the length say it's a custodial sentence you know they're taking into account what the minimum term is and the minimum term or the um, might be uh, different different depending on what how serious it is whether there was a knife or not a knife you take into account aggravating factors mitigating factors was there an early plea has the person spent time on remand or on a, a tag? And all of these calculations are spoken. And it's just numbers, 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 numbers. And the actual sentence can get lost within that. Um, and so when a child is in court, you can imagine, you know, this is a highly stressful time for the child. They're super anxious, particularly if it's a serious offense and they might be facing a custodial sentence. Like, you know, imagine being like 14 or 15 and you don't, your fate is totally in the hands of this judge here. You don't know if tonight you're going to go home with your mum or whether you're going to be carted off to a, you know, a young offenders institute or a secure training centre somewhere and not and, and be in this environment that's frightening, the, where there's a lot, you know, you might know from your mates, there's bullying, there's, you know, um, terrible food, you're kept in yourself for a long time, particularly at the moment with um, COVID. It's a really anxious time for them. And trying to engage that child, trying to help that child understand what you're about to tell them in terms of the sentence is really challenging for a judge. Um, but some of them don't really seem to try very hard either. Like, so they will deliver the judgment, the sentencing remarks as they would to an adult. Um, and I did, um, so I was, I got invited to do some judicial training for judges in the Crown Court. So the Judicial College is the body um, they run lots of modules, lots of courses for judges and judges go maybe a couple of times a year for a two or three day residential and do different modules. So I was asked to do to go along and talk about um, I did I did a few actually um, about children's rights in the trial and then sentencing. So to help kind of um, with that training, um, I interviewed I've interviewed about a small number, like seven, seven children who've, had ex, who've been sentenced in Crown Court about their experiences of sentencing, what they thought of the judge, what they thought of the process, how they felt, what they could understand, what they didn't understand. Um, and then I asked them to read three different types of sentencing remarks. Um, so a typical one off the, that get, has been published one that's supposed to be clear that the court of appeal said this is a this is a short you know this is how you should write your sentencing remarks and then one that i um i'd asked a magistrate to write that was a fictional one but complied with our principles of what a children's rights sentencing remarks would look like so very clear well structured well signposted simplified language 
um, showing empathy for the child, reflecting back the child's experiences. And so acknowledging that the child's grown up in a difficult environment, the, um, you know, mom and dad try their best, but they're not always great parents. Um, you know, we, you know, recognizing the child's ambitions, the child wants to you know, go and be an, a mechanic, um, giving the child hope for the future, all of these things. And the, the children, I, it was so powerful speaking to these young people, like some of whom have been in prison, um, most of whom had not, but had been facing potentially going to prison. And they were all so um, um, positive about the children's rights sentence and remarks. Like it, they, it was so interesting. They, you know, when you're speaking to them about court, particularly kids, um, the, the young people I spoke to who were black or mixed race, um, they just felt this real sense that the judge was um, already made up their mind. The judges sat through the whole trial and they felt by the time they got to the sentence, the judge has already basically written them off. They also expressed bias around race, um, but not just around race, also about this, you know, the judge is up there, they're powerful, they, they have no idea what my life is like, they just don't know, they're white, they're middle class, they're middle aged, they don't know what my life is like. So this sen real sense of distance between them and the judge, not understanding what's going on, like the language kids young people in sort of research done by speech and language therapists don't know words that we would you know that are so common in the criminal courts victim they don't know what that means custody they think that custody you know to us that means going to prison they think custody is around which is the same word you know being taken off mom and dad and being put in care for example um they don't know what um you know um parole is but they're being told that in three years they can apply for parole they have no idea what that means or being let out on license that means nothing to them and they you know this sense of like they just had no clue what was going on and when they read this set the sentencing remarks written by this judge that was written for you know that was very clear explained things you know you, you can come out on license what that means is blah 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 um, that showed empathy that gave them hope you know when when you've served your sentence you know I really hope that you can go on and, and go and be a mechanic you know I really think that you can do this Sh giving them that trust the young people I interviewed honestly their faces just lit up and these were like these were like not kind of like you know th these were kids that have seen some of life and like you know then they're, they're not going to be easily patronized they're not going to that you know might be a bit cynical but they so responded to those judgments and 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 were saying things to me like you know God, if, if a judge had spoken to me like that, I think things might have been really different. It makes me really, I, I get really moved listening to it because it's so powerful listening to these young people. And so I've been trying to like give voice to them through the judicial training and, and trying to convey to judges like a room full, I mean, gosh, it's scary. Like, you know, like standing in front of you lot, uh, 200 first years can be, you know, at the beginning of September, each year at the beginning of October, you get a bit nervous. Um, but standing in front of 70 Crown Court judges trying to tell them how to do the job, that's nerve wracking. <laughs> um, and some of them are like really respond to it. And some of them are like, you know, they just, they're just like, well, you know, they just don't, they just don't. Oh, I sometimes like to try and make these kids cry because I think it helps them, you know, you're like, really? Like they've clearly been through a lot. Yeah, they've broken the law. And, <laughs> but for many of them, they could easily be on the other side. I think that's what we know about, especially serious offending those kids will have been victimized in their lives too and they could have easily been the victim in these cases and it's you know their backgrounds are the same and yeah so so i've been involved with doing, doing some judicial training i've also been working with the judicial college to try and revise their main guidance that they have um so hopefully that will that will come to fruition this year um yeah, i've got a meeting on monday actually with a again with the judicial college with one of the judges who um, who's developing a new module on communication in the courts so um i really hope that i can have some input there as well um so that's been i have to say like the children's rights judgments project has been brilliant um academically from you know and i've loved every minute but the thing that's been most powerful has been talking to these young people and then trying to um get some change in the courts and you know um some judges have been really wonderful and, and letting me know that they have been trying to do these things in practice um, and, and talk to me about their experiences of doing it and how they feel that it's been useful um, all the challenges how hard it can be as well so showing empathy empathy for a defendant 
when you're also got the victim or the victim's family in court is really hard. Like that's, that's a very difficult balance to strike. Um, so yeah, it's, it's constantly fast, you know, like being able to use your academic work, you know, you sit, you read, you think, you come up with these ideas, but you don't know whether it's going to have an, um, you know, how much relevance it's going to have, have in practice. And when you find that it does, it's just so, um, you know, I don't know, it gives a lot of meaning to your work. It, um, it's, it's really rewarding. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's kind of, so yeah, it does have relevance in sentencing. And, and I think that's where, for me personally, I, I've seen the most um, impact of my work, I guess, on sort of real life practice, I hope. Um, so I know people are probably sick about, sick of COVID and hearing about COVID and you're probably sick of talking about COVID. Um, but it would be really interesting to know about your upcoming chapter that you've written about children in the criminal justice system during COVID times. Yeah, so I was, um, it's, it's just a quite short chapter I, I, um, for a book that's going to look at all as like all different um aspects of law and the legal system and the impact of COVID. Um, and I wrote it last August, so we were still really in the midst of it, but thinking we were coming out of it at that point. And it, it's a, I guess it's a survey in, in, that, in that case, what I was in that chapter, I suppose I was thinking about taking stock. The, the, the premise of the book is to think, is for us to think, okay, um, in 2008, we had this big economic uh, crisis and that led to austerity so it led to like you know um, cuts in terms of you know um, benefits across the board legal aid investment in youth and children's services etc cetera, etc cetera. and we're now facing this other economic crisis as a result of covid how should we respond in order to secure justice and so that was the context of writing the chapter so i kind of um set out you know the impact of of COVID on children. And it's obviously been absolutely immense. And I was particularly interested, focused on children in the criminal justice system. So, you know, the two, the, there are, for children in the criminal justice system, COVID had um, ju just enormous impacts. You know, first of all, um, um, kids being processed through the system, it all went to remote, remote, you know. So if you're being interviewed in the police station, your lawyer might be, on the other end of a phone instead of next to you in the police station. Um, if you're doing a court hearing, it could be on computers. And obviously this has a massive impact depending on your, um, you know, it, um, it exposes inequalities. So it exposes the fact that you're trying to do it on your phone because you haven't got Wi-Fi at home on your on a computer. It exposes the fact like here, sitting here now, like you will be making, and anybody watching this will be like looking, you know, we'll do it. Oh what's that picture on the wall oh, look. Ooh, what's that there what's that you know you can see my background you can see I'm in a room it's got a fireplace guitar picture on the wall some you know other backgrounds will expose um other you know will expose that somebody doesn't have the luxury of a room to themselves to be to engage in um criminal proceedings so if you've got a judge and then a child who's probably got you know, coming from a very different background, that is all exposed on, never mind the fact that the child can't communicate properly with their, in a courtroom at the best of times, but suddenly how are they supposed to communicate with their lawyer, who's also just a box on the screen? So you've got that, you've got kids in, in prisons. They were, children in, in, during COVID, children were kept in their rooms or their cells for about 23 hours a day. They were um, they yeah 23 hours a day and, and to be honest that happens sometimes anyway when kids are kept in isolation but this was happening to um, in most institutions between 22 to 23 hours a day they were going to be in their room on, on their own they weren't having what's supposed to be provided in terms of education they were getting like um, you know a, a, a leaflet not a leaflet but like um, worksheets pushed under the door it keep them busy for 20 minutes and then that'll be it for the day now some kids felt actually one of the upsides was some kids felt safer and that goes to speak about how unsafe they feel in these institutions at the best of times that when they're out in the communal areas and so on it's not a safe place to be all the time but obviously it had a massive impact on mental health for them um, and the risk of covid of course being in there and then the knock-on is 
with all the there's massive delays now in the court system that we know you know so some ki kids are committing offenses have committed an offense and they might not end up being tried for it for another two years like how that is a massive and already there were massive delays so there's delays in justice um that are going to have implications for these children in terms of these um uh, events that you know mistakes that they've made or whatever you want however you want to talk about it hanging over them for the next two years um and then so you've got the impact out directly in the criminal justice system and then you've got the massive impact across the the, the system um that increases i guess what we might call criminogenic factors so um you know, kids are out of school, right? We know there is a massive link between kids being excluded from school or out of school and getting involved in offending. Um, that might be because they're out on the street more, they're more susceptible to um, um, exploitation in terms of gang exploitation or other kinds of child exploitation. Um, kids are being, um, there's less visibility of them if they are um, um, sort of going missing for a day to sell drugs because people don't know where they are. Um, there's no, so all the support services that you would normally have, so schools, um, youth services, things like that. Th those adults who might be keeping an eye on these kids aren't, they don't, they can't, and they don't know what's happening to them. Conditions at home are really stressful because everyone's in the house, it's cramped, you know, um, that can lead, that can have negative impacts. So all of the sort of factors that we associate anyway with offending, um, you know, kids are out, they're getting pulled up for COVID breaches um, by the police who get sucked into the system that way, maybe. So it was just a hot, you know, a real conflation of all these issues that is going to have massive long term impacts um, on increasing the vulnerability of children to offending and then how they are then treated in the system. So it's just, yeah. So I, I was just arguing that we just basically um, just need to invest. We just need to invest priorities in kids and, and, um, um, try to address those uh, those um, factors really, and not not go back to austerity. That's uh, a bit depressing. Oh, I feel a bit depressed now. <laughs> I know, and that's the end of the interview as well. And <laughs> Sorry, ending on the low note there. But well, do you know what? The, 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 I mean, there will be positives, and I think. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Catherine, for joining us today. It's been really interesting. Well, thank you for having me. I love. I, I'm sorry. I do. I probably talked to quite not quite as much as Josh, but I just it's so it's so um, great to be able to just talk informally about your research because it's what you know really drives us and what makes us um, love our jobs and um, be able to share it with students is really brilliant. So thank you for giving me that chance. No, no worries. Thank you very much for coming and thanks for everyone for watching and we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>